Good morning, my name is Brian, Brian Arthur, and our study is entitled Christ, the Light of the Nations. Revelation, um, or the coming of light, or the coming of reality into our scenes can often be a tricky thing. Uh, generally, it's, a, it's something that breaks and destroys um, illusions and bondages. I was caught up recently, not so long ago, um, riding my bike in front of a school. I had a trailer on the back, it was a cold day, so I had those uh, lycra leggings on. And uh, it was school leaving time when I got past it and there was a group of giggly, I reckon they were 12, year 12 girls standing out the front. And um, one of them said, oh, nice trailer. And then with a bit more bravado, another one said, uh, nice bike. And then the, the coup de grace was, um, nice legs. <laughs> so I stopped about 20 or 30 metres up the road and the giggling increased and just slowly took off my helmet <laughs> and my skull cap and the light just faded. <laughs> and they, they just dissolved into the schoolyard. And I suspect they'll never get over the fact that once they, they ogled a bald granddad. But I kept going and I'd never had anybody say nice legs before, so <laughs> that was a revelation I could take. I suspect without the leggings it would have been different. We're going to look this morning at Revelation. No, we're not going to look at it. Our prayer is that, uh, that the light of Christ is here amongst us and that we may, we may be dealt with according to that revelation, according to his heart. But our discipline this morning, or my discipline, is to stay within Matthew, Matthew's gospel, and to hear uh, what happened in his heart when the revelation of God was unveiled before his face, and to see how that took Matthew from where he was into a whole new world that was wider and fuller and richer than he'd ever dreamed. So that's, that's our mandate. So the question I'd like to start with is what actually turned Matthew, who was a fallen Jew, if we believe his name, we would understand that he once belonged to or belonged to the tribe of Levi, which was a, a tribe that ministered in the temple. But he'd gone from that to being a tax collector. And for whatever reason, we're not told what, what, why he went that way, but that was a uh, a, a roller coaster of disillusionment somewhere in there. And it was the revelation of Christ that had to actually come up against what had taken him on those steps from being one that was called to minister to the heart of the people of God to just ripping the money off. Something inordinately powerful ha had to actually implode into Matthew's life for him to be brought from that to a true son of Abraham. 
And when we read his gospel, we get glimpses of how that happened. Or rather, I think we get windows that, that Christ opened to Matthew. And through those windows, he shone straight into where Matthew was. And where Matthew was, was a terrible place. We're not going to go into his calling, but, but uh, the Lord just broke straight in. And he was transformed. Something incredible happened. It was no small thing for God to actually clear away the disillusionment with religion and then clear away the idols that took the place of true faith in God. And Matthew became a true son of Abraham, but not because he saw Christ from a distance, but be actually because Christ was there face to face, flesh to flesh with him. And so what Matthew saw by the grace of God was a whole man. A whole man free to be with Matthew. And not ashamed of Matthew. And not deflected from the disillusionment in Matthew, from the idolatry, by the idolatry in Matthew but free to be there with Matthew and say, Matthew, come with me. Not afraid that where Matthew was might pollute where he was, but confident that what he brought would overcome the horror of where Matthew was. And so it did. And what Matthew saw secured him fully and healed him fully and focused his heart fully. That would be a good prayer for us. Lord, secure us fully and heal us fully and focus our hearts fully on that great light that comes into the world and has come into the world. Luther, talking about the light of Christ in this passage, said, don't you think that this is an inexpressible light which enables us to see the heart of God and the depth of the Godhead. That's who Matthew saw. That's what dragged him from the pit. And that we may also see the thoughts of the devil and what sin is and how to be free from it and what death is and how to be delivered and what man is and the world, the nations, and how to conduct oneself in it. No one before was sure what God is or whether there are devils, what sin and death are, let alone how to be delivered. This is all the light of Christ. So as we begin to examine Matthew's witness to this light, we really must be consumed, not by what Matthew said, but, but by the light that gripped Matthew and reconstructs heart, hearts. His gospel, Matthew's gospel, is the testimony of a man gripped by the wideness, the finality, the completeness of the presence of God in Jesus Christ for his people, for all people. Matthew's world, and it comes out in his writings, was... Uh, Matthew lived in great conflict. He, 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 he lived in a time where he watched the rending of the wineskins of Israel. And the scholars reading Matthew look at some of the, the conflicts that Matthew looks at and records and they see seeming contradictions But he was in a strong conflict. And when you're in a strong conflict, the things that you share sometimes don't appear to hang together all that well. But even a bird's eye view of Matthew's writings show us a staggering wideness to the plan of God in this man, Jesus. Jesus.
his very opening verse where he talks about the creation of the Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham, brings a wideness that never stops but fact, in fact grows through his writings. The description of Jesus, the commencement of Jesus' ministry, and we'll go and look at some of these things, but the commencement of Jesus' ministry in Galilee of the Gentiles. All of these things come as windows to him of Christ breaking out of the exclusivity that Israel had become and was perpetuating as the way it should witness to the rest of the world. And then, of course, finally, Matthew ends up after the cross with Christ dispatching the disciples to the four winds. So he was truly a son of Abraham. But there were many people in Matthew's day who, uh, like today, find it more protected to become observers of somebody else's writing and their techniques and the little peculiarities of the way they write rather than who they're writing about. But it is Christ for the nations who is here this morning as he was with Matthew. And he's here as the healer of the nations, of your nation. So it's God in Christ actually saying yes to you as intensely as he said yes to Matthew and pulled him out of his, out of his tax collecting to be a son of Abraham. If we're not careful, we can ignore by distraction, by being distracted, the revelation by which Christ changed Matthew and the disciples. It's staggeringly possible to deflect the light of God and turn it into some clever search of men to look for glimpses of God when God is actually standing right in front of them and breaking open to very unlikely people the glory of the Father. Perhaps it's even more tragically possible to consider the light in Christ as some little pinprick like a one of those cameras that you use when there's an eclipse of the sun and you see a tiny little duplicate of the sun on the paper when the blazing sun is out there and you become infatuated with the little pinprick. And it's, and it's tragically possible for us all to be so caught up with the small things, the peripherals, the style of ministry, the style of ministry that we slowly move from being priests of God in Christ the temple to being tax collectors. And it's staggeringly possible to take the glory of all that happened to Matthew and to build it into some protective system like a suit of armour so that we can hardly move and nothing more ever gets in. And we just cook away in there in the sun, in the light of the sun. All of these things were bubbling around Matthew. But in this paper I'm just going to assume Maybe it's a big assumption for the scholars, but that's where I'm going. That the glory of what God was doing in the man Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee of the Gentiles so gripped Matthew that the themes he opened up come from that glory. And with the impact of that glory as strong today on us as it was for Matthew because this is God's Messiah. 
It's a very different glory than going to Matthew and, and seeing Matthew pulling a few scriptures out of the Old Testament prophecies and weaving them into some story that may help people understand more about Jesus. That is so far from what happened in Matthew's experience. One scholar says, Matthew is not merely looking for random Old Testament proof texts that Jesus might somehow fulfill. Rather, he's thinking about the shape of Israel's story and, the, and, and linking Jesus' life with those passages that promise God's unbreakable love for his people. Matthew, if you look at his gospel, was bubbling over with the sense of fulfillment. That's one of his major themes. It comes, if we're not careful, just clinically. These things happen so the scripture might be fulfilled. <laughs> and we just tick them off and say, oh, goody, you know, that proved that. But everything, according to Matthew, everything in the Old Testament suddenly was standing full in front of him. Son of David, son of Abraham, the incarnation of wisdom, the son of God, king of the Jews, suffering servant, Moses, all of these magnificent, Gifts of God to Israel suddenly seem to be just the shadows of what was standing in front of him. Eleven times he talks about things being fulfilled. But for Matthew, I think these, this is not just a technical search. This is actually God standing in front of him saying, these things are now final and complete. You are now to assess yourself on the basis of these things being true. Could Matthew get a grip on it? Doubtful. Could Matthew witness the ripping and the tearing of the revelation of God in all this fullness standing in front of Israel and Israel not having a bar of it? Could Matthew witness to that without strife and without tensions? And without contradictions, of course he couldn't. Could Matthew witness to the expanse of God's mercy pouring out onto the dogs and the lepers and the pagans without running out of words or logic? Right up front, in verse 1, we're fronted with this staggering ministry of God's Messiah to Matthew. Matthew begins the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, or the book of the genesis of Jesus Christ. That's a, how many of the scholars translate it? The book of the genesis of Jesus Christ. So like John, suddenly we're confronted in the opening section of the gospel with creation. Both John and Matthew saw that this man, Jesus Christ, or saw the revelation of God through him standing before them was something that affected the whole creation, not just Israel. So right at the beginning... God is opening up Matthew to extremities and to boundaries that Matthew could not understand. But in that verse, he's not only saying something about creation, he's saying something about David's kingship and that now being full in this man that you see and Abraham and the covenant to Abraham, that being full as you now see Jesus, that my salvation, Isaiah says, that the salvation of God may reach to the ends of the earth. Not just the word about some Messiah in Israel reaching the end of the earth, but that that salvation, 
reach the end of the earth. In the genealogy that follows after that first verse, Matthew includes uh, four, the names of four women. And if you go back and study those women and study those names, you'll see that they were a long way away from, in um, pietistic terms, qualifying to be part of the life of the Messiah. But it's with the coming of the Magi in chapter 2. I think, Matthew, uh, th there's some wonderful stuff here. The main players, of course, in that scene were Jesus, the Magi, and Herod. And each one, particularly we're going to look at the Magi and Herod, each brings their own witness and reaction to the light. Herod kind of brings the, the um, reaction of what sinful man does when confronted with the light of God. His heart gets inflamed, he becomes insecure, he sees this is going to cause a tearing and a rending and I'm holding out on that and his heart turns to murder and all he can think about is tearing away from his existence this revelation that God has put before him. The Magi on the other side show that pagan man can become a true worshipper of the living God. They come with the hearts that really should have been in the true Jew. Herod was only a half a Jew, but he should have had the same heart. I think Matthew's inclusion of this story brings some pretty good revelations. Let's have a look at some of them. We know that the Magi were not considered by Judaism to be worthy recipients of any revelation from God because they sought in all the wrong directions to find it. They looked at every ism that there is and that there ever was to get messages from God. Israel looked upon the Magi as we would look upon the leaders of the New Age movement. They represented the dark side of humanity apart from the law, apart from revelation, apart from the worship, apart from the prophets and the covenant of grace. So everything about what they were doing was suppressing the truth not arriving at it. And suddenly, they rock up at the birth of Jesus. Something incredible has gone down in their hearts. The fact that Matthew includes the story is a grace of itself. You can, you can kind of think of a straight-laced Jew saying, well, we better not uh, give credence to the Magi. <laughs> That's going to pollute things. Their doctrines are going to come in and their doctrines are... No, you can hear evangelicalism. And every religion, like Judaism was at the time, establishes an evolution of shrinkage and narrowing. And they see and begin to see the light of God as something, as a commodity for them to protect. But Matthew saw the light of God breaking in on pagan astrologers or whoever they were and opening up the possibility of coming and kneeling at the foot of the Messiah who was born in Palestine. So with these four women and now the Magi, Matthew's world's getting expanded 
and the exclusivity that he grew up with and disillusioned him probably, and he discarded and went into tax collecting, is falling away, has fallen away. And then one of his, it is fulfilled quotes in Matthew 2.15, is an interesting one, where in, in 2.14 and 15 he says this, and he rose, talking about Joseph, and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Now to be fair, the prophet wasn't talking about the Messiah when he said those words. But Matthew brings a theological connection and he sees not a people coming out of Egypt but one person and that one person is Jesus Christ of Nazareth and he's saying at that point something startling here in Israel Jesus stood as the only true Israelite coming out of Egypt And now Jesus becomes responsible, you see, for all that Israel didn't do and never accomplished. And so we come to that explicit statement in Matthew 4 where Jesus begins his ministry. And I'll read that passage just briefly. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet, there he goes again, might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, on them light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach the kingdom of heaven being at hand. Jesus grew up in Galilee. Most of his ministry occurred in Galilee. In Matthew's gospel, through chapters 4 to 17, it's all contained there in Galilee. And it's in this major section of Matthew that Christ continually spoke about his primary mission to Israel, and yet many times there's a kind of pressing in of the nations through individual pagan people into the blessing of that kingdom. Galilee of the Gentiles is the way Matthew talked about Galilee. None of the other apostles, uh, disciples talked about it that way. Matthew does it specifically, I believe. It was a melting pot or perhaps a better known as a fringe area to Judaism. It's where Judaism met the pagan world. And in no small way that pagan world had impacted in that area. It's referred to by the prophet and then reinforced by Matthew as a place of death and darkness where people were actually living in death pretty unlikely place to go you'd think to begin your ministry who were these dwellers in darkness and death in the Isaiah text they were the two tribes Zebulun and Naphtali who were the first two northern tribes to get taken off into captivity And that invasion and captivity preempted a filling up of that area with non Jewish people to claim the fruits of war. And, is, and Galilee had become a mixed blood scene. So much so that just before Jesus, the Jews decided to actually take people out of there by force back to Jerusalem to protect them. So Jesus comes into this place where everybody's simply sitting in the dark, immobilized, sluggish, 
where neither the Jews that were there or the Gentiles were there had any light in themselves. And it's into this hopeless situation that Jesus ministers. So that these two disparate tribes the first by dint of their faithlessness taken off into captivity. And Jesus comes and says, God is opening up the wideness of his mercy in front of you and in your hearts. So this smattering of unbelieving pagan people who come to Christ in that section is a promise of the flood tide that's coming. Let's look at another window. A Gentile soldier came to Jesus in Capernaum and his servant was in trouble. Jesus had just finished the Sermon on the Mount and the first person that he'd cleansed was a leper the archetypal person of rejection and the exclusivity of a religion that could not deal except to reject what it didn't like and what didn't fit into its system begins to tear at the seams. And then the soldier comes and uh, he represents a second rung on the ladder, reject, in terms of Judaism's thinking. He was a Gentile. Lepers couldn't even go into the temple or into Jerusalem. Gentile men were allowed into Jerusalem, but only into part of the temple. And suddenly, in the face of Israel's exclusivity, God's light is breaking open to the most unlikely people. Lepers and pagan Gentile men. And the whole basis of it, as we see in that story, was faith. The whole basis of their inclusion cuts against the ethnic qualification, the religious qualification, and these guys come out of the cold, as it were, meet up with Jesus and discover that God's agenda for humanity is not to put them in little boxes and keep them there in some kind of security, but to open himself to them so that their heart embraces him and says, we trust in you. And in that very section, Matthew says this, that is, this simple revelation that creates faith will be the mark of those who come from the east and the west, all the nations, to the eschatological banquet. Up until that time, Judaism believed that the only thing the Gentiles would get from that banquet was an observation, the opportunity to see it, and maybe get a few crumbs. Up until now, the Jewish scholars had said those coming from the East and West are Jews. They belong to Israel. So their their revelation was, one day we're all going to sit down, Jews from the East and the West, with Abraham for the big nosh-up. Problem was, Abraham would have walked out. And that's what they were seeing in Jesus. Somebody who had the audacity to say, no, that's not how it is. And the light was breaking through and the cracks were widening. So now with just two miracles, the leper and the Gentile soldier's friend. Jesus had cut through 
the accrued exclusivity turned it on its head. We time just to look at one more window. And it's this Canaanite woman in chapter 15. Jesus had just been engaged with the Pharisees over purity issues, exclusivity. And again, he withdrew. Matthew has, in an earlier section, said, this Messiah is different to what you expect. He's not going to take you on. He's not going to sort you out. He's going to be gentle. So he, he goes from the exchange with the Pharisees and he withdraws. And he withdraws deeper into Gentile territory. Not because he was on mission there, he was just being the Messiah who would not quench the smoking flax. Nevertheless, as he's there, a great ministry occurred. A woman sought Jesus to free her daughter from the cruel demonic powers that had engulfed her. In Matthew's Gospel, he actually talks about this woman as a Canaanite. Now, we might say, well, so what? Well, the other Gospels talk about her in perhaps more subdued terms as a Syrophoenician. Canaanite was the word used for those that were there in the land when Israel came in way back into the Promised Land. And by calling her a Canaanite woman. Matthew is not taking it up to the Jews. He is simply saying, your wineskins of exclusivity do not fit with the presence of this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And not only does he call her a Canaanite, but he actually records that she addressed Jesus with the most Jewish of terms, son of David. They called him demonic. This pagan Canaanite worships him as the son of David. Something grand. The light that had broken in on, on Matthew and hauled him off from his tax collector's bench he saw breaking out all over the place and in this woman. She called upon him because something of the light of his compassion had convinced her. And all the merciful grace that had been there through Israel's history in all her adulteries was now actually breaking out on a Canaanite woman and her daughter. I wouldn't have a clue how to exegete this story. I think you had to be there. I know uh, I grew up in what you could call a fastidious type of Christian background, where Jesus would never have ever called anybody a dog. So immediately you have to start thinking, what did he, you have to water that down. I don't know. This was a feisty exchange. But I think the glory of it is not in, the, in, in understanding every part of it, but the whole of it. And here's this glorious picture of a woman who sees the compassion of God in Jesus Christ and she is going to come and lay herself at the feet of that compassion and call upon him. This is a great miracle for somebody who's lived in the land of death and the light of God must have broken through and it was still going to break through. But what we see in the end of the story is that Jesus was in no way tardy about healing this woman's daughter.
She didn't draw it out of him in some kind of overcoming his um, tardiness towards her. There's something else going on. Maybe it was the growing of her trust through his response. I don't know what was going on. But it's a beautiful story. And the exclusivity, that was the suit of armour in which Israel had encrusted herself, could not hold the life of the Messiah. And it can't today. Tonight, um, Randall's going to move to the study on the cross. That's where Matthew ends up in his gospel. And from that cross, this great one that's broken into his life and these pagan people goes out to the world. But the point that I'd make and I'd finish with is this. The light of Christ is the only thing that can draw us from whatever dingy Galilee of the nations that we're in. It's the only light that can break through in what holds us, whether it's demonic or whether it's the love of money or whatever, what holds us in the death throes of that dingy nation of Galilee of the Gentiles. When Christ comes, things give way. And if it's a religious system that we're in, that will be ripped and torn and healed. That's the story that Matthew brings to the world and to us this morning. We were going to have a hymn.